Alex Cannon, who's gone from working in bars in Mallorca to owning the highest selling jewelry brand on Shopify, Crafted. There's a lot of bad advice out there, and I think never quit is is awful advice. I think the most successful people have quitted at a lot of things. I think you need to. I think quitting is an art. I think you need to know when to give things up if it's not working. People need to start at what the end goal is, and then work backwards from there. So if the end goal is to be ultra wealthy, then follow your passion might not be good advice, but if your goal is to be fulfilled and enjoy every day, but you don't care about being ultra wealthy, you just want enough money to do what you need to do, then it's good advice, follow your passion, I think. What was the key goal we've crafted for you? 10 grand a month. Passive, that would be, I, was, I, was, I was happy with that. But then the goal posts just change. Now I just think what's not possible, but I think the most important thing for anyone to do before anything else is to decide what success is to them and self-evaluate themselves. You could just leave one pearl of wisdom that could impact this audience and move them forward 1% from today. What would that be for you? And we are back bringing you another absolute banger this week, guys. We are coming live from Liverpool with the man himself, Alex Cannon, who's gone from working in bars in Mallorca to owning the highest selling jewellery brand on Shopify, Crafted. Mate, welcome to your house and welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, bro. Thanks for uh, thanks for travelling up. We finally got it done. We've, been... We've, we've, been, we've been trying to do this podcast now for about, what, a year and a half, two years, I'd say? Yeah, it's been a while, so thank you for your patience, bro. <laughs> no, I, no, I appreciate you having me in your, in your humble house, mate. And Well, it's, it's not humble, is it? It's a beautiful home, but... Yeah, I appreciate being here. I think your journey is such an interesting one because you did the typical English lad thing, went working abroad and and kind of started off there and kind of found your way through so many different, we were talking about this before the podcast, like you, you've had so many different traffic lights you've arrived at and it's like you've gone through green light, amber light and gone to different different destinations, modeling, you've done, you've done so many other different businesses on the way to this jewelry brand. So just break down for the audience so they can kind of understand the other side. Cause we heard Danny's side of the crafted story, but I want to hear your side and how you, you came into from going from these bars to move into like e-commerce and everything like that. Like you said, I was in uh, Mallorca bartending, doing different businesses, doing online businesses, uh, nutrition businesses. And I was also, I was originally a PT. So when I left school, I didn't want to go to uni. I enjoyed the gym. I'd been training for a couple of years, so I thought I'll do my personal training diploma. Then done that, and I thought I just want to go and get some sun. So I went and started doing summer seasons, and I also started doing um, network marketing businesses that were re- revolved around fitness, so like nutrition and stuff. And um, that went on for about five, six, seven years, maybe seven summers, I think I did. And then uh, in, in that time, I was I'd come home in between. Um, and when I got to about 25, I was like, I had a quarter life crisis and I was like, I need to stop doing this, go and make something of myself. And then I went home, started doing, well, I started, started trying to do more modeling and I went to shop myself around the agencies in London and none of them were really, you know, fancying me. So I uh, was just focusing on the personal training and I wanted to do the online stuff because I realized quickly that no matter how much I charged per hour, I could never scale it. But f- uh, further than what I was charging and there's only so many hours in the day so my focus was going to be on the online stuff so I thought I need to get in front of more people but social media wasn't really a thing then there was Facebook there was no Instagram so I went to uh, the local Tesco and picked up every uh, fitness magazine took them home found out who the photographers were found them on uh, Google got their emails emailed them all one of them got back to me gave me the Contact at Men's Health or Men's Fitness, can't remember which one. Ended up shooting a cover for them, uh, and the other one, men's, whichever one it was, ended up doing the other one a couple of years later. And then from there, then the model agent started uh, approaching me. And then one day, my agent called and said, "MTV, been in touch. They want a model who's got a bit about them." And they said, "They said they put me forward." So ended up doing that, going on TV, and then when I was on. Uh, when I first went on TV, it was when Instagram first started picking up. I thought, I've seen kids doing like modeling, but just on their page with free, with clothes or getting paid to wear clothes, I thought this is like a cheat code for me. So um, my goal then was just, right, let's try and make build this as a shop front. So I started getting clothes, modeling on my, my Instagram. And then from there, that was when like the 
bedroom brands every week there was a new brand coming up and everyone was doing well off it it was because like influ- influencer marketing just started so people were just sending them out and it was, it was great for e-commerce at the time facebook ads and all that was easy to do so there was a boom of bedroom bedroom brands people were calling them and i was modeling for them all and uh so i could i seen all these brands making money and i thought i, that, I want a bit of that well i just i knew that what my what my strengths were so i was waiting for the right strategic partner and um then about after about a year or so of that after the tv stuff i was modeling for foot asylum and the lads i was knocking around with were all like models and they were they'd be on tv too so foot asylum called me in to uh the meeting was they wanted me to get me and the boys to be like the foot asylum family but when i was in there i sort of knew that the shot calls around the table i knew like the the top guys were around the table, so I just flipped the meeting on his head and pitched this brand at, at them, and uh, that ended up being a footwear brand that I had with uh, my best mate, Jay Parker, who's got Jim King, and we did that. And in the same month, because I was modelling a lot, and I was getting jewelry, getting jewelry from like Top Man or whatever, and it was never of high quality, so I was like, there's a gap in the market for that too. So within the same month that I did the trainers, I uh, reached out to Danny, because me and Danny had connected on a on a brand that he had previously, which was called Circular Watches, because he'd uh, been asking me about, you know, different stuff, influencer stuff and whatever, so I'd, we'd spoke on that. And I, I liked the way he, sort of his outlook on business and freedom first and all that, and I was very much the same. So I just asked him to come for some food, and I said, I'm going I'm to do this jewellery thing, I think there's a gap in the market, this is why, etc., etc. And we started that up in the same month as the trainers, with a couple grand each, and that was... August of 2018 and uh, yeah it, and, and then I said to myself in 2020 I want to be no more modelling I want to just focus on my own brands and then obviously 2020 rolls around Covid hits that sort of forced my hand a little bit anyway because you couldn't model and then uh, craft had boomed I sold the other business and then it's just been on from strength, from strength, strength to strength from there so you knew early doors when you were building your own personal brand and building this modeling career that you were building that to put your put your own brands on your on your own self and you know fund your own brands. You, you never you're never doing it as a long term career because a lot of people go and do that kind of stuff and they go and get locked into doing it for years and years and years. But you kind of had a vision and you foresaw what was kind of come through, did you? Yeah. So even when I was doing the whole influencer stuff and the modeling stuff, I would never do a brand that I didn't like myself you know I was I was always very conscious of I'm going to be doing my own thing in the future so I can't ruin my credibility by doing you know x y and z so it was always it was always, it was always just a short term thing for me so anytime an opportunity came up where it was to go on tv it was only it was never t- to be you know on tv as such or be famous as such it was literally just this is a way to get myself in front of more people so I've got a bigger platform so then I can launch a business to more people and have a potentially more customers in front of me so that was all it was it was just a stepping stone to get me where I wanted to go. One of the bits that you, you you didn't quite touch on, but I know that it's had a a powerful change in quite a lot of areas of your life, I presume, is like when you had to care for your mum and you had to do do all that with her and go through all that with her and and really like how did that kind of change and change you as a person but also like push you forward? Yeah, so that was when I was doing the summers, I'd come. I'd do three months away in the summer, and then I'd come home and I'd care for my mum for you know the whole of the winter. So I started doing the businesses that I was doing with the network marketing because it allowed me to stay at home and still uh, try and build quote unquote business with like you know passive income as, as they say. So it led me down that route with the you know learning about business and stuff, um, and led me to into more personal development because. It was tough times and it was tough for me, so it led me to a lot more reading and trying to figure out, you know, what can you get from this? How can you learn from this? And obviously, I would give anything to have it back again, but I've got to be. I'm, I'm thankful for it because it's made me who I am, and I'm proud of who I am, and I'm, I'm somewhat happy with what I've attained and, and where I am. And I wouldn't be this person if I hadn't gone through that. So. I'm I'm grateful for it for that. Obviously, I'd change it all, but that's the that's what I take from it and how she was. She was so strong. It's uh, yeah, I took a lot from that and just I just took all her traits and I just try and keep them with me. 
Yeah, I mean, it was it was. I, I was listening to another podcast with you talking about more into more depth about about that that you were going through at the time of your mum, and I think the way that you approached it with the way that you were both framing your mindset was a beautiful thing, you know, because your mum had something that was quote unquote incurable um, and couldn't be treated. But the way that you came you used to come back and you used to you use your personal development stuff yourself and try and frame her positive mind. And you both had that kind of journey together. And I, I remember that you, you, I think it was your dad that said to you years afterwards that, um, that he 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 understood why you did that, and he believed that you'd carried her forward for years longer than what she would have lasted if you hadn't have done that. Yeah, yeah. So when she, it was maybe a year or so into her being really unwell, and someone introduced me to a law of attraction book that I read, and then I was just so like down at the time. I thought, let's just you know give it a go, and I got to the last, the last page, went back to the first one. And it just a lot of it made sense to me, and I thought, it's, well, I've got nothing to lose by thinking this way because thinking this the way I'm thinking now is not getting me nowhere. But then I started reading it to my mom, and and yeah, like you said, the, the disease was incurable. It was just so rare. It was like there's not even any medication for it. So, and um, yeah, I was like, I remember because this is my mum's old house, so I bought it off my dad when mum passed away. And so we'd walk, I would like guide her walking up the kitchen just so to get her, egg, her legs moving because she couldn't. It just your body's just shutting down bit by bit, basically. And I just we'd walk up and you know we'd just have a laugh the whole way up and listen to the music or whatever. And I'd walk her back down. By the time she's done up here and back down, she'd have to sit down. She'd be exhausted. But then I remember coming to my dad and he'd just say, "Skinny, you're wasting your time." He calls me skinny, so he's like, "Skinny, you're wasting your time." And I'm like, "Well, it's giving me hope." So I think every a human beings always need hope, whether it's you know whatever it is. I think hope is what we all need. So I think years later he. he he understood it, and he said, "You know, if I think if you wouldn't have been that way with her and got her thinking the way you were thinking, she would have been gone a lot sooner." And I believe that too. I think, you know, I think that's why people die of quote unquote a broken heart. It's when you lose hope and you just think, "What's the point?" Your body just goes, your body believes what your brain tells it. So I think you can just shut off and you can go. So I think, yeah, maybe I gave her hope, and but she was just, she was just such a, a, a overwhelmingly positive person. Anyway, when I told her about the stuff, she was like, "Yeah, of course." Do you know what I mean? She would like enter competitions and be like, we're going to win this caravan. Do you know what I mean? Just think about it. And she just fully embraced it. So yeah, it was, uh, yeah, I've got great memories of her when, even when she was, you know, the way she was, because we, 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 we laughed and laughed until, until the day she died. She never lost a sense of humor. She never showed no weakness. She was, she was a, an amazing woman. The be- the beautiful thing there, you said that you gave her hope, but when I was listening back to your story, she gave you hope in those early days when you were modeling, when, when you didn't kind of want to do that. Yeah. So I kind of think it went full circle for, for you and your mom. And, and when I kind of realized that when I was, when I was listening to this, it, it kind of hit me about how, how that had gone full circle. Yeah. My, my mom was always trying to, uh, push me into the modeling from when I was maybe like 16. And back then there was like, you know, it was just, it was the next catalog. They were the only models you knew. She been, she was always like, my my art house should be in that catalogue and all that and then she ended up uh, putting me in touch with a photographer and I ended up getting photos taken and, and then I ended up with an agency and I, I remember sometimes I'd come back from when I'd been away and my, I'd speak to my agents and they'd be my mum would have been on the phone like why isn't our Al in the next catalogues yet and all that so she always thought that I was you know um, best things to slice bread as all mums do but uh, yeah she, she really pushed me into it and uh, yeah she just yeah she's she thought the sun shined out my eyes, so maybe that's where I get my uh, self belief from. A beautiful full circle moment, then, really, isn't it? When you when you actually break it down, like how, how it's all come about, and you, like you said, when you come to situations like that, which which can never be easy, and you can never really summarize with anything more than you, you're always going to feel pain when you talk about that moment. But you can also think about those times that you spent in the kitchen, and you know you're, you're lighting her up, and she. And, she's laughing away and it's, it just makes the whole thing kind of more purposeful to you, doesn't it? Yeah, and it's funny because, and I don't know what it is, I was talking to uh, my missus about it only a few days ago. I, ca- I can only remember being unwell. I can't remember it. I can't remember much from my childhood ever being well. And I don't know what that is, whether there's a block in my mind, because surely you should block out the bad things, right? But it seems like I'm only remembering the bad things. 
So I don't know what's going on there, but yeah, my memories of when she was unwell and we'd be in the kitchen and, you know, so you could call it dancing. It probably wasn't, didn't look like dancing because she could barely move, but we used to laugh so much. So yeah, it's all, it's all fun memories. And it, it you know, sometimes times people, when she comes up, they, they say, oh, I don't, you know, sorry if you don't want to talk about it, but I love talking about it because it just, you know, keeps her alive. So. Yeah, she, he, that that spirit never never goes on, does it? He always continues. Well, so what do you think the biggest pivotal thing that your mum and your mum's attitude taught you that's allowed you to smash it in business and life? My mum always used to she 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 believed that, that there was there was good in everyone. She used to say that nobody's ugly, everybody's beautiful, and she 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 would see good in everything and everyone. So I'm like I treat. Every situation like that, every person like that, every person I meet, I'll try and find the good in them. Every other meet, I'll try and find the best trait you, you've got. If I'm in a situation, I'll try and find the best uh, situation and opportunity, the best part of it. So she she was always looking for the the shiny the shiny stuff. She was always looking at the shiny stuff, and I think that I do believe that everyone's look. Well, obviously, we're all looking at the same things, but it's what you really you know you know you you train your brain for. Like if I said to you, how many round objects have you seen today? You you wouldn't know, but if I was like, I'd give you 100 quid for every round object object you see the next 24 hours, you'd be looking at everything like, that's round if you look at it like this, you know what I mean? Like, that's round, that's round. You'd argue with people about what's round and what's not, and I think when you've got your, a mindset of looking for things, you'll see things that other people can't see because you're looking for them. So I think that's the main thing I got from her is really, you know, seeing the just the, the good and the beauty and everything because, she, yeah, I always remember saying that. Nobody's ugly, everybody's got something beautiful about them, so... Yeah, it's definitely just our outlook and 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 uh, our approach to life that I, I, I get from her the most. Like now, when people talk about her, they just the things people say about her. If people say things like that about me when I'm gone, then I'll be a happy man. Yeah, it's it's something that you can always carry with you. A, a lesson that you know carries all the way through your business and your career, and and always brings you back to that grounded groundedness that you had with her. You know, and and doesn't matter how much money you make or how much success you have on the front end it's like you know you can always ground yourself back into that energy of seeing the world from the full perspective and, and that that is powerful yeah absolutely and i'd never actually thought about it like you like until i just vocalized then to you that that's really where it come from is just is from her seeing the best and everything because yeah there's just that I'm, I'm very solution solution not problem orientated you know what i mean see the solution is not the problems it's definitely from her well, it's easy to come on a podcast like this and we can talk about all day long about how Crafted smashed it and we could we can talk about that journey and we and we will do, but it's very easy to forget the the key traits where people and where people get these key traits which carries them to success. And like I said, when I listened to your backstory in more depth and I understood how much of a pivotal part your mother played, I thought it was it'd be a it would be it'd be not it would not be a good service to not include that and to kind of have you articulated the way that you have because that that to me is why you carry yourself the way you do completely i appreciate that yeah and yeah like i said before i don't i, don't, I never really thought about it in that much in that depth before um but yeah it's definitely that definitely comes from here for sure yeah the obviously crafted the brand now this year has become Shopify's most uh but most successful jewelry brand men's jewelry brand and I don't think that's quite settled into your head yet because when I mentioned it before the podcast I, it, it kind of like it doesn't it doesn't really phase you it's kind of like you've st- you've still got work to do uh, has that settled into your mind that 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 is your reality now yeah I mean I've, I'm not really I'm not really one for the um you know the figures and this and that and you know I don't really get it caught into or buy into it or or get sucked into all that I'm just in trying to do the same thing I was doing from the start just enjoy it and make good products and do cool creative and, and, and build a good business and have fun while I'm doing it and do it with good people so I mean obviously the success is amazing and I never I never anticipated it going to where it was uh, you know me and Danny said when we started we'll build it and we'll sell it for X and now it's like you know it's just gone way beyond that so but the thing is when you as you acquire things and you you hit milestones the, the goalposts just keep changing so it's it's it's, it's more important to enjoy it as long, along the way rather than going you know when i get i'm going for that going for that obviously keep going for it but you've got to be you've got to be hungry but still you know happy with what you have it's like it's a bit of a uh 
it's a bit hypocritical or it's a bit of sort of like a, a juxtaposition because you know you obviously got to be chasing something but you want to be happy with what you with what you have and, and where you are so it's like just enjoying the journey as cliche as it sounds that's what I'm trying to do and just yeah every day enjoy it and this year really trying to you know take it to a new level with the the, the creative and all that that's, that's that's my bag it's just the creative and stuff so this year we've been doing that I think it was on a shoot yesterday we've got two shoots next week um, lots of collections lots of campaigns and that's 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 all my bag so uh, yeah with the obviously it didn't like you said it didn't see us getting to where we got, got where we are with the being the apparently the biggest men's jewelry band on Shopify which is amazing obviously never seen it getting there but yeah happy to be here <laughs> when I when I was looking at it from the outside looking in into to try and ascertain okay where's where the strengths are in both of you obviously I see the strengths in Danny driving the um, the Facebook ads and all that kind of stuff that you know he's doing all that and then you're driving all the creative and when you and when you've married that together that's that's where all the success has been it's been from your creative the non green necks and all that kind of advertising around that in the early days and then you've driven that creative and you've pushed it forward can you break down for me how you look at creative and how you've and how you kind of positioned yourself to step out of the mold from what you'd learned from working with other brands that were doing it perhaps wrong yeah, I mean, for me, it was always because I was the model. I was the like the face of it. I was originally I was the customer, so I did. I founded the brand to solve the problem, so I knew what 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 it was created for. So, with the whole how the brand looked and the perception of the brand and all that was just natural to me because I was the customer. So how we shot it, everything, who we put it on, how it looked was just all natural because it was what what I seen was missing in the market. So it was almost like not really that well thought through it was just a natural thing and then with the ads and stuff um like you said it was a perfect marriage between me and danny because i think a lot of businesses hit trouble when there's two people who are, t- who are, who are similar like if it's two creatives i think they'll butt heads i think it, it need, you need to have a yin and a yang so i think that's why me and danny marry so well and uh his marketing background also does come into play a lot with things like the um like you mentioned the, the more green necks so i had the idea for the ad for the ad uh, in 2020, that that sh- that that you're you're speaking about, um, my friend manages a gym around the corner, a hotel spa, so we snuck in when it was closed, filmed the advert, a couple hours, got it edited, it looked great, um, sent it to Danny, and Danny says you should put no more green necks at the start of it because that's what what we're about. So I said, okay, cool, bang that on, and then that was what. That's now like our um, that ad that the ad that's like we're renowned for is the sick of green necks. That was what it started for. I was, couldn't find jewelry that wasn't turning my neck green or didn't turn green, so that was why it started. So it was like, it was just made sense. And now obviously you see a lot of other brands doing it, you know, the no tarnishing and, and all that kind of stuff on the ads. But yeah, we were the first ones to do it. And uh, yeah, it was Danny's idea to put the stick of green next at the start because it grabs attention. So me with the making it look nice and, and all that and shooting it and the creative and the, the visuals and then Danny's sort of touch on attention grabbing, it was, uh, it was the perfect mix. And it did like 30 million views, didn't it, that ad? Yeah, I think others have done more since then, but we've got a few different different formats. We've got that one, a couple of other ones, and we've done different variations of them, but that original one was the best one for a while, but I think other ones have uh, about done that. I actually think the one that done the most was just me talking to camera upstairs in the bedroom, I think was the one that done the most, but yeah, that was the one in 2020. Uh, Danny scaled it through America and whatever strategy he used for that. Um, I think we acquired a load of customers for a good price and then you know we built a database one with that ad and you know just gathering emails as such and sort of breaking even on the first the first purchase and uh, and then obviously you can retarget them and, and all that other stuff so do you, do you find that what what kind of percentage of customers come back to you after they've bought that's what we're working on most this year because obviously it's um it's like clothing you'll buy t-shirts two t-shirts three t-shirts I think our repeat customer right now is you know what I couldn't quote me on it. I think it's between I think it's about twenty percent, which is really good. Um, but it's something we're really trying to work on this year, build the community. we I've started working on some clothing as well, which I'm excited about, which no one really knows about. because uh, when I'm doing shoots, people are always asking where the clothes are from. Obviously, we need clothes to shoot them. It's always been my wardrobe. All the shoots that you've seen is just all my wardrobe. So people are always asking where the shirts are from, and I've always wanted to make my own clothes. Um, but I like it now because it doesn't have to. There's no pressure on it. I'm not going to do a big loads of numbers. I'm not going to do loads of you know different ones. It's just doing it because I want to do it. And if it doesn't sell it, nobody cares because the bread and butter's 
it's it, you know the jewelry and it always will be so it's just a nice luxury to have that there's no pressure on it and i can just make the stuff that i want to make and it's just exactly what i would wear and that's what, and that's it so you're just going to do limited runs of of shirts hats things like that anything that you're going to use on a shoot you're just going to do like 100 pieces of it and then and then see if it sells out yeah exactly so just the shirts that i want that i can't find on the market it's just the same as what i did with the jewelry i know the exact way i want a t-shirt to fit i know the exact way i want a shirt to fit i know the exact way i want the shorts to fit and every now and then i'll find a pair that i like but i couldn't I'd just go and i want them in every color if, if i could have my way i would just have the same shirt in every color the same t-shirt in every color the same long sleeve t-shirt in every color so i thought you know what we'll just do it and if not nothing else i've got a fresh new wardrobe so happy days the in obviously everyone's telling everyone to go out and, and follow their passion and do this and do that and that's the way to to make the money and to to fulfill your destiny what's your opinion on that i mean it seem it seems to me from the outside when i look at it that you've pursued what you're interested in and and that's where all the results have come in your life but is that entirely true that statement or have i missed something that kind of you could give me a bit of an insight on that i've overlooked for me it's absolutely true yeah and i almost have a chip on my shoulder that I've, i feel like i've never actually had to work hard because it doesn't never felt like work to me when i was doing the, the fitness stuff i loved it i was in the gym when i was doing the, this or the train i love trainers I was designing trainers when I was 11, 12. It never felt like work to me when I was doing the jewellery. It doesn't feel like work to me when I'm designing it, when I'm shooting it, I'm having fun. It's never felt like work. So I have a chip on my shoulder for that, and I really do. So, I, yeah, in a way for me, follow, yeah, as being following passionate towards the only things that I enjoy doing. Do I believe it as sort of a blanket statement for everyone? No. Not, 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 if, you, not if your goal is for a monetary end. If your goal is to become wealthy just follow your passion as a blanket statement is terrible advice because your passion might not lead to riches but if your passion is to be happy and fulfilled of course because if you're waking up doing what you love and you can make you know 50 grand or whatever it is a year doing what you love and you're fulfilled then it's great advice but if you want to become a, a multi-millionaire you, and your passion is you know I don't know something that's just not going to derive them uh, that their income then you're wasting your time so I think you can, yeah, it depends what your end goal is. If it's to get ultra wealthy and become a whatever multimillionaire, then it, it might be bad advice. But I think if you want to be happy and fulfilled, you can, yeah, for sure, follow your passion and everyone can make it a good living, especially now in the day and age where, you know, you can monetize pretty much anything now. You can you can monetize any interest now if, you, if you're really savvy with it, with, you know, social media now. So anyone can make a good income if they're savvy with it, off their passion, if they figure out what their passion is. But I think follow your passion and find your passion is quite a daunting thing to say, like, if someone says to you, what's your passion? Like, if someone said to me, what's your passion? I'd be like, I don't know. I just, I don't know what my passion is. I like I like doing things that I enjoy. So I think it's quite a daunting question. I think a better question to ask someone is, what project would you like to work on is a better, less daunting question to ask someone because I think asking someone what your passion is is quite like a, such a, like they think it's a, like you have to it's such a big question whereas if you just say what would you like to work on I think is a better way to look at it and you could change it can chop and change when you when you're talking about it as like projects you want to work on though what would be a kind of you know from your experience what would be a time frame that you should probably work on a project to see if you can find success in it like shoot is it is it is it give it 12 months is it give it three years is it give it five years like how long should people give it to kind of see if they're they're suited for that path well again it depends what you're doing it for so if you're if you're doing it good to enjoy it if you do it if it's your real passion and you enjoy it you would do it for free anyway if you're doing it to for a monetary end and it's not working after five years and you know you need to get you need to give it up i think there's a lot of bad advice out there and i think never quit is is awful advice i think the most successful people have quitted at a lot of things. I think you need to, I think quitting is an art. I think you need to know when to give things up if it's not working. But like I said to you before, you need to, people need to start at what the end goal is and then work backwards from there. So if the end goal is to be ultra wealthy, then follow your passion might not be good advice, but if your goal is to be fulfilled and enjoy every day, but you don't care about being ultra wealthy, you just want enough money to do what you need to do, then it's good advice, follow your passion, I think. So what was the key goal with Crafted for you? I would have been happy making uh, 10 grand a month. 
massive. That would be, I was, I was, I was happy with that. But then it, the goal posts just change. Then you, you, you know, like I said to you before, the goal, the, just everything just changes. So you just think, then you go, oh, then you just start. And now I just think, what's what's not possible? Like I, I kind of think from the outside looking in that the goal was probably freedom, which is why you've had monetary success. Hundred percent. The goal for me was always freedom. It was never uh, a, a number in a bank account. It was freedom. So that was why um, I said to you before about why me and Danny got on because I was like, I want, I want freedom. So, but I want the businesses and I want the money. But because freedom's there, I need to have. Uh, you know, freedom to be where I want to be and do what I want to do. So we set up the remote working from the beginning. So then when COVID hit and it was 2020, we didn't bat an eyelid because we was already doing it because our our original ethos was freedom. So we set everything up from that. That was the the re- original reason I was drawn to Danny was because he was of the same ilk as me as freedom was the number one priority. And we, and that's with our staff and everyone. People work when they want. It's just results driven. Get the work done. Do what you want. I don't care. It's just results based. If, you, if you're not doing the work, then we'll talk about it. But I think, you know, I want to punch in, punch out. You want happy staff is, is happy staff. Do you know what I mean? You want happy staff to work hard. And if they can, if you can get the job done, done in an hour, then get it done in an hour. I think a lot of times if you make people sit down, you just get a lot of busy fools and you get people just taking the piss and doing what they want to do and not working half the time. Whereas if you give someone a task, say so do it when you want to do it, as long as you do it to the standard that you're capable of or better yet beyond that, then who cares how long it takes you? We're just about getting the job done, and that's that. So what kind of staff number are you at now? About 16 staff, or...? We've got about 13 staff now, yeah. 13 staff, so you've kept it. For the kind of turnover you guys are doing, like 16 to 20 million a year, or whatever it is now, it's like that's that's a small amount of staff to turn over that amount of money. What's, what's the key to keeping the staff number so low and keeping it all remote? Well, only up until... Me and Daddy were laughing, like, for a long time, it was just, you know, me and him, and up until about... A year ago, there was on the creative side. There was no one. It was just me. It was just like I would, you know, design the product, shoot it. All the social media stuff was me. And again, it was like I didn't really mind it because I enjoyed it. Uh, I think the key to keeping the keeping it low is again the freedom aspect of it. Everyone, you know, there's everyone. A lot of people in the business do multiple things, and um, and we give people the flexibility and freedom to no bad ideas. No, no idea is a bad idea. Everyone's ideas are welcome. To test and culture, if someone's got an idea, we don't decide. We'll put it to the market and see, and let the market decide what the, what the market thinks. Obviously, to an extent, it's got to be true to the brand and the brand DNA, and it's got to, can't be damaging, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the freedom that the staff the staff get, people work best when they feel happy. So, I think that's I think that's a big part of it. All UK based, or you, are you based all over the world? All UK based, yeah. 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 Do you think? Do you see problems with brands that try and outsource to other countries and scale their staff that way from the jump? You can get to it. like we've got to where we are now, just doing the full remote work and thing. What I do think to get to the next level, we want to go to, we need more brand collaboration. Would be good to be in an office more and all that kind of stuff. I think it's. I think yeah. Then in, in this day and age with technology, and if you're really good. At managing people remotely, and you can delegate well, and you can manage people on different time zones. There's really no, there's no limit to what you can do, really. But if you want to build a brand, building the brand and building the business is two completely different things. You know, business is just measured on numbers, and it, I think you could, could scale it to whatever you want remotely and and outsource them. But if you want to build a brand, you know, it's that's a that's a different thing. I don't think I don't think you could do that remotely completely forever. Quick one for you guys. This podcast is sponsored by ContentRemover.com. As many of you are probably aware. I set up contentremoval.com in 2017 to help people remove all forms of online content and I've looked after some of the biggest names and brands in the world doing it and I would love to help you if you're struggling. If you're struggling to remove images, videos, search results, fake accounts or anything online, go to contentremoval.com and we'll help you today. I've seen a few UK brands in the last, say, three years that are determined They've had all this success in the in the in the e-commerce space, online, remote. They seem to want to go and build build big offices, and they seem to then want to go into Oxford Street. Is that something that you see see crafted following suit with in terms of like having a physical location, or will it always be optimized for online? And you're not going to follow suit because you don't think it's a good idea. I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go say as far as Oxford Street, but I think I, I definitely like to do pop up stops, pop up shops, and. Give people a feel for the brand, let them put hands on it, smell it, touch it. Definitely want to be doing stuff like that. I, I wouldn't. Uh, I don't think I would open up a permanent store somewhere. 
maybe, maybe not. I'm not against it, to be honest. I, I do like the idea of, you know, people come, like I said, come, being able to come in, touch it, smell it, feel it. Um, but it's no, it's not, uh, it's definitely not high up on my list. I do think it's definitely got, it, it definitely plays a role because it's, it, it builds the brand well and it allows people to come and see what the brand's about and it's it's an experience. So I definitely do think it plays a part in, in, in the brand side of things. If you're looking at it from a business w- w- strategy, no, because obviously the overheads and stuff it comes with, but from a brand perspective, it's definitely, it plays, it plays the part, yeah, for sure. How how do you know when it's right to do that though? Like how how far in and to a brand should you be thinking about whether you should sink that into like building more brand equity? I think it all just comes down to overall strategy. I mean, for us now, it's about distribution and different distribution channels. So if we was to put a lot of resource into open a, opening up a store, then that would be able to, that would take away from the resource of what they or what they what the goal is for the uh, distribution. So I think it all comes down to personal goals for the business, what your brand, what your vision is for your for your brand, and uh, and where you see it going and where your strengths lie, um, because. For us, if we wanted to go and open a store now, that's a whole that's a whole new a whole new business on its own because we don't do it no wholesale, it's all online. We've got nothing physical. You know, we barely go to the office, we go to the office once, twice a week. So it'd be a big change for us. So for us it's it, it wouldn't make sense right now. For other brands, uh, I've seen brands do it really well, you know, who sort of make the shop almost the, the hub for the brand. And it's and it's amazing for the brand and they build a great community which is which is, you know, really uh a vital part of building the brand so I think yeah it's definitely got it, it, it definitely plays its part it's just not right for us right now but it, it, there's there's two ways there's two ways to kind of that I've seen it done there's kind of like the represent the represent way which is where George does his pop-ups and he and he's in like um flannels and all that kind of those kind of stores flannels or whatever they're called in London and then um there's the gym shark way where they go and they go and build the big facility and they go and furnish it out and do all that and there's two kind of ways that it's being done at the moment do you ever see yourself allowing crafted to be in other people's high-end stores as well and having a pop-up within someone else's brand yeah absolutely we've you know we've been to with some of the with some of the you know more luxury stores and it's something we, we want to do because my my vision for the brand is to go more more down the luxury way uh like i said the clothes i'll be designing and we'll be all the best materials and you know there'll be no um we won't cut no corners with that, so it's, it's definitely more about the luxury movement for moving towards that for for us. Obviously, the the brand DNA will always be accessible, but it's, I want it to be the, the you know the pinnacle of that. Yeah, and then and then when you do when you do position the clothes, I suppose when you first start selling them, you'll you'll start selling them through those high end luxury stores to so that from the jump you're branded right and branded into that luxury bracket. Yeah, and then obviously people can get there the feel for it and they can touch it and see the quality of it and, and all that, you know. So I think that's, uh, yeah, that'll be the next step for us. Like I said, distribution is, is a focus for us now um, and that's one of the channels we'll be looking at. One of the things that I saw you do, I think it was a couple of years ago, you started to do this 100 club type promotion that where I bought a couple of pieces off you at that time. There was um, a lion piece and an, an angel wing piece on these gold chains that I bought from that and, there, and and also some pearls once as well when you first did the pearls thing um i like the way that you did that because obviously that creates that scarcity when when you created that scarcity with the, the way that you launched that and I, and I want you to break down how you did that did did that drive that to sell out super quick because of the way that you structured that whole lead up to that yeah i like you said it's the scarcity and the fomo aspect of it isn't it you know it was limited that was 100 100 couple 100 pieces of each um, and once they're gone, they're gone. We went bringing them back. So I think, yeah, people want what they can't have. So there's, there's that aspect to it. And I, even me myself, I, I I like wearing stuff that no one else has. So if I know that once that's gone, that I'll have it, and I might, I'll meet ninety nine other people will have it. But that's worldwide. So I think there's that aspect of it. So that gives it a luxury feel, even if the price point's low. Like Supreme, you know, they, the the price point isn't really exceptionally high. But once they're gone, they're gone, and then they be get resold for God knows what. So yeah, it's the it's the FOMO, the fear of missing out, the scarcity of it, and um, it makes it feel special because it's like the uh, it's like supply and demand, isn't it? You don't want something everyone else has, so um, not when it's like an intricate piece like that, anyway. When it comes to driving ads through through the different channels, how many channels are like crafted focused on? Are they just focused on maximizing out Facebook and just driving that channel, or do you have to or or 
do you have to go multi-channel from you know from the jump? We started obviously. Uh, it wasn't we we didn't really start pumping it with the Facebook ads. It was more uh, obviously at the time I was modelling and I was still I travelled a lot still with modelling for the first uh, you know two years of the brand. So every time I was on a shoot, I'd have my camera. I'd be with other models and I'd be just like I'd put the chains on them and and I'd take pictures and that would be the, I would be doing the content, the the modelling, the shooting the models, the posting of it all. So it sort of spread that way originally, and and then obviously we started doing the Facebook ads. And obviously you acquire customers through the Facebook ads, you get their emails, then the emails become a channel, Google, et cetera, et cetera. But um yeah, I mean that's that's more the other side of the business for me. It's not really what I what, what I dabble in, so I couldn't speak and articulate it as well as, as most. But yeah, it's 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 across all channels. Um, Facebook, email, being you know, big channels for us and you know, or Google and, and all that as well. So Yeah, I suppose once you've once you've built that email list, that becomes a real powerful, powerful conversion thing. For you to keep keep acquiring customers at you know when you've already paid for it on the front end and they've already bought products it's like just free money isn't it essentially all the time yeah as long as obviously you don't want to just be peppering them with emails because people could just switch off unsubscribe not open the emails etc so it's about curating that well and you know we've got uh, Josh who works for us he's a great member of staff he's been with us since the start and um top boy shout out Josh how do you balance and how does Josh balance how many emails you should send to the list and how often you should pepper them then how how are you balancing that and, you know, how are you doing it in terms of from a brand point of view of delivering value but then also selling? Well, every every email can't be selling, you know. You can you can, you can send them a message or, you know, you just talk about new product or behind-the-scenes stuff, you know, it could be educational or entertaining or it could be a sale or it could be a sale. But we don't really do sales. We do, like, two sales a year. So that's something that we're very, uh, we're very strict on because a lot of brands now will just be on sale all year round especially jewellery brands, you'll see them on sale <laughs> two for one all year. And I think that's a bad move personally, but, you know, each to their own. Uh, I don't think it's very good for a brand. So uh, our emails, uh, yeah, like I said, maybe we should get Josh on to get in to speak about it. But he's brilliant with it. He's very, uh, you know, the the emailers feel like they know him, like they know who Josh is. He's like a character a character in the brand, so he's doing a great job. So, so you, 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 you're essentially saying turn your staff into characters for the brand as well, and then, and then build that into the culture. Well, Josh mainly because he's very front facing, so he's, he's, he's communicating with them as much as well, more, more so than anyone. You know, they'll know I'm a part of the brand because they've seen me modelling it or whatever it may be. But yeah, Josh is speaking directly to them, and he's signing it as Josh. Or I'll send some emails. We'll say let's send a message from me, so it'll be from me or me and Danny, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But yeah, John, uh, Danny, uh, Josh has a lot of obviously direct correspondence with the email list so they feel like they know them it does really really create um, funny things sometimes that you know no one else would think about and then you see other brands you know like do the same thing because they're obviously subscribed to josh's list and they see the creative stuff he does so again like i said earlier no back no idea is a bad idea we give everyone freedom to do, to do creative things obviously we all you know sign it off etc but uh yeah, there's been some wacky and, and, and wild ideas that have paid dividends yeah, I've I've signed up to quite a few different brands' email lists just to see what copy they're sending and how they and and what they're putting out in terms of value compared to ask. And I'd not seen a brand that allowed their staff to sign off emails the way that you guys do. That's something that's quite rare in the space. Not many e-commerce brands are doing that. Um, so that's that's something I want this audience to pick up on is the fact that you allow the staff to sign off on the emails, which is create which allows them to create a relationship with your clientele and that's another win for the brand I said essentially uh, the the only time I've seen it done is with like brands like Ryanair when they reply to people on Twitter and it will be like you know dot, someone said that um that the, the the service is shit and then Donna's got and Donna's wrote a little joke and then signed it off Donna you know what I mean that, that it, it's it's nice isn't it when you yeah, see yeah. it when you see that kind of it just gives the brand a bit more of a personality when it's not just a a brand name it's more of a it's josh at crafted character yeah, yeah you, you're creating characters so would you would you suggest then that that if you're an e-commerce owner or someone looking to build an e-commerce brand listening to this podcast would you say that they should be curating their staff to create more characters within their business so that they can use them to build the brand that way as well i wouldn't say it is is uh as blunt as that but you definitely need to find out ways to relate to your customer so Putting a person, putting a person behind the emails rather than it just looking like a you know a scripted email from whatever it may be, knowing that there's a person behind it and it feels like more relatable to the customer. 
I think is a, is a key point because people buy into what they relate to. So I think the fact that Josh being good at being able to communicate that with the customer is is uh, is vital. Yeah, I think they just they want to be people want to feel a part of something, and that's something I learned when I was doing network marketing is people just really want to feel a part of something and they want to feel valued and they want to feel seen. And I think that is where uh, where the, where the real lesson is. I don't think it's making your staff characters as such. It's just making your customers feel seen and heard and a part of something and, you know, making it about them because it is about them. Without without the customer, the, the, the businesses and the brands are nothing. So um, it's, it's trying it's trying to uh, portray that and and communicate that with them. Let's, let's talk about your your best skill as I see it, which is the kind of curating that that brand feeling and you know the 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 essence of how the brand looks on social media and the, all the creative is all is all you uh, essentially and and overseen by you and then and then it's probably probably a few other people at the back end that, that I don't know about but that's kind of the thing that I believe really cuts you through from other people so how we, how have you reverse engineered that I mean is it just does it just come from your personal style and then you put it onto the business or do you have a, a set did you create a set of brand guidelines that you wanted to like a look board that it wants to look within so that it and, and then communicate it through that or how are you doing that so for the first four years it was just it was all just I winged it all it was never there was never no mood boards made there was no um, planning done for shoots it was just let's get let's book somewhere sick a sick villa or a sick location even a studio a lot of the time in the winter let's just take the wardrobe down there let's get the models there whether it's me or whether it's other models and let's just style it up and, and make it and make it look good. So there was never really that thought out before. But now this year, twenty twenty four specifically, it's more about now. Let's really think about it. Let's start storyboarding ideas out. Let's step the creative up a bit. Let's tell stories. Let's build the uh, the avatar of the of who the who crafted is as a, if if crafted was a person who who is that and what does that person look like? Um, but you know, coincidentally. Well, not coincidentally, it's just really the character is just me, so it's easy for me to do. So any ideas I come up with, it's just what, like what 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 am I interested in? Or now I have only up until last year. Now I've got staff in shout out Zach, yeah. So now I have Zach to bounce ideas off with the creative, and uh, and I'm fortunate enough to have people around me. I'm a videographer, I'm a photographer who I've always worked with from my modelling days. They've always been my guys who I work with um, on my shoots. So we all bounce ideas around, but. Up until this year, it would literally be, I've got an idea in my head. I would rock up to the shoot and I would just bl- like spill it out to my guys and then we'd all go, all right, cool, cool, cool. Let's do it this way. And we would just do it. And a lot of time, um, and it always worked. Well, I think now we want to take it to the next level with the creative and, and the storytelling aspect. And we did a shoot literally yesterday. Uh, I think it had been my favourite shoot we've done yet. And it's just, yeah, the storytelling of it and, and just the thought that goes behind it because I'm not really an organised person. And my mind's just chaos, so uh, it's organised chaos now. So I found that's my favourite. That's that's the way to do it. Before it was just like, you know, spilling it out and let's just let's wing it. So now there's structure behind it. I think it, the brand's really going to take shape even more so this year with the creative. And I, I'm absolutely buzzing for this year more so than any any other year that we've had because the creative that we're doing. Then now I've got like the, the the help with the guys and the the new product that I'm doing, which I'm absolutely buzzing about. I'm more excited now than ever. And uh, yeah, I just uh, I can't I can't wait. How long do you suggest that brands run with um, a similar, like a small line, before they expand into the the bigger lines? Because I some I sometimes see that brands brands go have success with two or three products, two or three hero products, and then they go thirty products straight away. And I think it's probably the wrong way to approach it. Like, how have you? scaled the number of pieces in the collection as you've gone through the years yeah I would I would always 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 say start small for sure start small you know whether you need to sell it out and restock or you need to you know you could do the, you know pre-sell it and pay if you stock that way I'd always start small and add bits and bobs and then try and keep your minimum orders low and then you know figure out what people like and what people like restock stuff that people do like and just build it slowly you don't want to be left with loads of stock we're obviously fortunate that there's no seasonality to our stock, so it's not going to go out of season or out of fashion as such. You know, clothing, anything like clothing or you know, food or drinks, or whatever. You obviously got to be very careful because you have got such shelf life on everything. You know, you might have a coat that's great now, but next se- next season, next winter, no one else is going to want that coat. So 
Uh, you've got to shift stuff. You can, if you've got too much, you have to sell it at a discount, damage them for the brand, or you have to give it to outlets that it's going to be seen and it's not good for the brand. So, yeah, just keep it small, keep it lean. You know, just don't get too greedy. Don't get ahead of yourself and build it small. Build it, build it slowly. How do you? How did you decide how many sales you're going to do though, so you don't damage that branding? Because obviously, you, you're very strong branding wise, and you know sales damage brands. So how do you? decide i mean some brands now i've even noticed don't do black friday they're, they're, they're staying away from it because of this damage that it does to the brand because of the discount yeah i mean there's a, there's the key sale times of the year isn't there right so there's obviously january people do january sale there's like a high summer sale and there's a black friday sale so that's what we we, st- we tend to stick to we might do a little sale here and there it's like you know a big holiday in america we're obviously you know predominantly u.s so if there's a big holiday in america we might do a little flash sale or something like that but nothing major yeah, some some brands choose not to do Black Friday. Kudos, kudos to them. I think that's a that's a bold move. Obviously, you you you're turning down potentially a lot of revenue, but if it's done right, it might pay off. I don't know. You could argue that that is that is that good or is that bad for the brand because you know there's some customers that may really want your product and they've been loyal and you know they they've been waiting for Black Friday. So you know you might be turning your back on them. You maybe not. Who knows? Only time will tell with things like that. But uh, yeah, like there's 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 a hundred ways to skin a cat. So what works for one person or one brand won't work for the next. What are you doing um, personal development-wise with yourself these days? Because I know you've been on a, a big journey with that in terms of like reading and educating yourself with books I think can grow rich and rich dad, poor dad and all those kind of things. I've, I've heard you mention in the past. How are you, how are you approaching edu- consistently educating yourself and what are you doing? To be honest with you, Frankie, only in the last... It was last... What was it this year? I think it was towards the end of last year. And I was like, I took a look at myself. And I was just like, I got a bit of, I got a bit ashamed of what I seen, of, of the person I'd become. I felt like I got a bit, a bit lazy, a bit fat between the ears. I got a bit comfortable. You know, business was going great. I had loads of, loads of, loads of money in the bank. And I just lost that hunger. And the person that, and the, the person that got me to where I am wasn't that guy anymore. I uh, sort of reevaluated myself, and uh, I've sort of put put my put my balls on the table again, put put my nuts on the line, and I've uh, I put myself out of my comfort zone because I've, I've I'm building a new house that's well out of my comfort zone, and and I feel well out of my depth, and uh, there's a lot of imposter syndrome going on, but I think I needed it because it's made me it's like got the, got me the the hunger back in me, so for a while I fell off the the personal development stuff, and personal development is obviously great. But people can do, obviously do it too much, and it just becomes a bit like you know you're you're doing it just to say that you personal development. When really people should read something and go. I used to get a book and just be like, "Where's the, where are the nuggets? Where are the nuggets?" And then when I'd found one, I'd go and like action it. So it's more about I think a lot of people do it just to say they're reading or like I'm reading ten pages a day. But what you, what you should be really looking for is solutions or you know what what can I action? So for me now, it's just about the personal development is just really on how am I pushing forward as uh, just becoming the be- the best version of myself. Not so much reading. I do read a lot. I'm, I'm more audio books. So like I said to you before, with the that gift you brought me, by the way, it's, that's one of my favourite books. Matthew McConaughey, Greenlight. So thank you for that. Uh, I listen to my books in the car. So I read a study eight years back that it was based in America. The the average amount of time that the average US citizen spends in the car, if they turn off the radio and put an audio book on within a year, they would have the equivalent of a master's degree. So I took that on board. And I only listen to audiobooks in my car. I try to from like Monday to Thursday. Uh, or podcasts sometimes. Uh, but yeah, audiobooks. And um, yeah, my personal development now is really just about me and my goals. Not really as, as such learning uh, or reading, uh, reading, reading a lot. It's about, you know, just getting up and, and getting after it. So especially now with the kids and, and time wise and all that. And I'm not really one of them. It's just I don't have time. Everyone's got the time. But you have, times for the thing, you have time for the things that you make time for. My time now is just for work and training and the and the kids that's it so um but i do i do think I, I do want to start reading more it's just what 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 am i what am i choosing to read because i want it to be specific to my goals not just like you know reading like another personal development book that says the same thing as the last one you said something profound to me before the podcast it, it i actually thought about it when i when i went in the toilet i was thinking about it you said to me 
Frankie, you need to have kids as soon as possible because it will change your life, mate. That was your statement to me in, in here. It just came out of nowhere when, I was, when we were talking about you and your children and, and how they changed your life. What is it about um, the children that's changed your life so much? And, and you know, you, I obviously see you as a great dad and, and see, see what you do, but like, what is it that's changed your life so much about children? Life's about becoming the, the, the highest and best version of yourself, for in, for in my eyes anyway. I think life is about becoming, trying to reach your potential. And I think when it's just you and you've got no kids, there's no responsibility to be that, to be that person, to be that guy. You know, if you don't become that person, you can just have fun along the way. Whereas when you have kids, it's like, you've got to be the best example for them. So it's pushing you to be the best version of yourself. Whether you've got a little boy and you want your, your boy's going to emulate you, or if you've got a little girl and your girl's going to, you know, hold you to a standard of what a man should be. So, I think it pushes you to be the best person you can be in in all aspects of your life. That's for one one side of it. You could call them selfish reasons. The other side of it is just there's there's nothing else in life the life has to offer that's, that's, that can, you can even compare to it because there's just there is nothing that compares to it. everything else in life. You can compare it can you can draw comparisons to it's a bit like that or it's a bit like that. There is nothing in life that's uh, compares to having children. And you and you can't articulate it like I can't articulate it to you. You you only understand when you have kids. Uh, one of my friends has just had a kid recently, and I I caught up with him before Christmas, and I I said, "Do you get it now?" And he goes, "Yeah." And I said, "Makes you think, what the fuck was I doing this whole time?" Does he goes, "Yeah." And I was like, "Mad, isn't it?" And it's funny coming from me because. When I had my first, I was the I was the guy that no one thought would have kids. I, I thought I never thought I would have kids. I was like, I just want to do me, travel and this and that, and I don't want to have kids. And that was always me. And I was, you know, I was loving life and living life. And I was the last person of all my friends that people thought would have kids. And uh, well, it's just yeah, it's just it's it's just a life changing thing. Obviously, you don't want to rush into it. You want to have it with the right person and and everything like that because you know that's a bit that's a that's a huge decision, but. For what it can do for you personally, and you know the relationship that the relationship that you get with your child, like if you have girls, you know it's like a honeymoon that lasts forever. It was actually Matthew McConaughey who said that that quote, and it's one of my favourites. Having a daughter is like a honeymoon that lasts forever, and I've got I'm lucky lucky enough to have two daughters. I've got a, a little boy on the way, so I can't wait to see what what that entails. Uh, if it's anything like my girls, then you know I, I actually can't wait, and maybe more. Who knows? Special man, it's special. It, it did. It did make me think because obviously society at the moment is being pushed towards. Um, you know, the girls are being pushed towards. You know, um, being promiscuous and putting out OnlyFans content and all that kind of stuff is sadly, um, you know, and and showing more and more and more of themselves on Instagram. You know, I can't even go on the Explore feed without seeing thirty-seven of the same women they basically all look the same all the same outfits all the same shots all the same angles and it's quite soul destroying for me as a man to think because you, you think to yourself what can I we're being encouraged as men to to go out and pursue multiple women and all this kind of stuff from that side of the community as well and it's like it's interesting when I talk to people like yourself that have experienced what people on the outside will predetermine as success um they usually Usually, the common the, the the common thing with the ones that are the happiest that I see and the most fulfilled are that they have a solid relationship with their missus and they're and they're fully um, fully committed to one person and they usually have children and and they they're pursuing that and that warms their heart too and I, I see it when I, it it's it's been a common denominator as I'm talking to nearly two hundred guests now it's been a common denominator the ones that are the most fulfilled have those things going so I think. The reason why I asked you that question is because I wanted to. I want this audience to hear that more traditional aspect and hear that m more spoken about, rather than this red pill, blue pill. It has to be, you know, toxic, and you have to have three wives and all this other crap that's being spouted all the time. It's just, it was just interesting that you kind of spoke that into it before we'd even sat down for the conversation. It's like that was already something you talked about. Yeah, and I, I trust me, I was like, I'd be the. I was the last person that I thought would be saying them kind of things because I thought I was just I was happy to be single forever. I had a great time single, and I thought oh, I could do it forever. And um, 
yeah, maybe could have gone down that path, but I'm, well, I'm glad it never. But, you know, I was laughing only today with my missus. Like, you know, I didn't want one, and now I'm thinking we're on a third, and I'm thinking I could have had more. So uh, <laughs> a friend of mine, he's, 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 he's an older friend of mine, he's a bit of a mentor to me. He's got um, he's got nine kids, and when I see him with his kids, and he's very successful. He's got a beautiful house, and he's with all his kids, and he's older, and I just think that is the, the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And when I, when I, I remember when I went for, for dinner with him, uh, one, of, one of the first times we spent some quality time together, and he said, uh, I'm the richest man you'll ever meet. And he's very wealthy. But I thought that's a bit brazen to say. And he goes, I've got nine beautiful... And he just flipped it and he said, I've got nine beautiful children. I've got a beautiful home. And I've got a house to Spain and all my kids love me. And I was like, wow, that's wealthy. Do you know what I mean? I said, that's real wealth. And every time I see him and he's close with all his kids, I just think that's a beautiful thing. And they're just like, it's just life, bro. It's, you know, life is life. is life, And just more of it around you is, is great. And they just kids are just so pure. There's just so much you can learn from children. Like the... They see things as they are, and as they see beauty and everything, and their curiosity and their imagination, and they live in the moments, and you know they they just see life as as it should be before we get battered down with whatever it is, you know, whatever you want to call it. Society batters everything out of you if you allow it to, anyway. Uh, I believe you should always have a, a childhood spirit, a, ch- a childlike spirit. But yeah, there's so much we can learn from children. Um, you know, all the while we think that we're teaching them, but really they're teaching us. If we pay attention, anyway, there's so much. There's so much to learn from children. I know it, it, it's it's um, a beautiful thing. I mean, even seeing my niece and nephew and some of just observing how they move and some of the some of the ways that they think about things, I'm like, that's some powerful. Power, there's a powerful lesson in that if you can observe it and take it in, rather than you know see you know trying to look through it all the time. If you yeah. just look at it, it's yeah. like wow, you know that's you know that they've they've got a sense of humor that, that 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 can get knocked out of them they've got um insights that they can teach you about yourself that you'll you'd never see yeah. you know where you're not fully present they show you yeah that's what i've learned from my niece and nephew when when I, if i'm not fully present and they are they're in that moment they live in the moment and the one thing i learned from my niece and nephew is when i'm with them i'm in that moment i'm not somewhere else yeah, and now that, and that was that's been the powerful insight, and that's not me even being a dad. That's being an uncle, and that's that's what that's taught me. So it was interesting that you the, the way that you broke it down before the podcast, and and it was interesting you spoke spoke that into into my life today because I, I I've I've been I've been thinking about the commonalities of success and what success actually is, and the commonalities that I've seen so far are like, yes, they've got their money right, and yes, they've got the successful brand. That's one part of it. But on the other side of it, the success I've seen um, in in the men that are most fulfilled and the women are most fulfilled. The women have got children. The, the the men have got the men have got children. But they've also got like a loving partner that's backing them up as well. And it's a commonality that it's just it just constant repeat. So the traditional roles that everyone says is outdated, they're the most successful framework that I see in society. I agree. And you touched on something there about. Uh people's versions of success I think the I think the most important thing for anyone to do before anything else is to decide what success is to them and who they and, and and self-evaluate themselves because I think a lot of people get told what success is especially now with social media and, and all that like when, when we were growing up there was no nothing no like seeing everything on Instagram and what what's out there and most of it's fabricated or whatever some of it isn't some of it is but success is different to everyone and if you just follow what you have been told success is or what social media tells you, tells you it is and that's not what it is to you, you'll get there and you will be miserable. That's why you see a lot of people who are ultra wealthy and are miserable because it's not they're, 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 not, they're not fulfilled in themselves. So if you can decide what success is to you, then it could be something completely different to that. If a, if a, if a woman wants to look after children and be a mother and that's what she wants to do, then she's successful. But if she was to, if she was told that success is chasing this and chasing that, and she chased it, but really she would have took time to think about what what would fulfill her, fulfill her the most, and that was that the kids. Then she's going to be miserable. Obviously, that path is for some women, so that's you know that's their their version of success. So go for it. But people need to think about what success means to them. And for me, it was always freedom. So why do I get there? What's the quickest way to get there? And what how do I structure things? underneath it so that I always have that and that will always that will always be it it was I've just been fortunate enough that underneath my freedom I've been able to build you know 
what I've been fortunate enough to build, but I would have been happy. I would rather be on a beach with a hut rather than being told where I'd be, where to be and what to do and when to do it. As long as I've got my freedom, that's always, always the most important thing for me. It's just, I've just been fortunate enough that, that you know, with the, with the brand and stuff, but it was always the freedom for me. And I wouldn't have cared if I had the freedom. I wouldn't have been like, oh, I wish I had that car with that house. Because if they are not free, I would rather have the, the freedom with the, with, without the money. Because I, because I was self-aware enough to know that. So I think everyone needs to do that piece of work on themselves. Like what, be self-aware enough to know what is, what is success to me what's important to me and from there you decide what you want and you reverse engineer it because you could get caught up chasing the wrong things playing the wrong game and and, and taking the wrong path and you don't want to get to a destination that you didn't put in do you know what I mean you, you want to go to the destination that you want to go to so I think everyone needs to do that piece of work and really really think about what, what, what success is to them because you don't want to waste your whole life chasing something that you didn't even set in the beginning it's it's the radical honesty piece, isn't it? It's like if you're not radically honest with where you actually want to end up, you'll and the, and you don't guide guide yourself by reverse engineering the process. You you leave yourself wide open to end up with your ladder lens against the wrong wall, and it's a wall that it's I've climbed the wrong ladders in the past. There's plenty of times I've climbed them, and I've been oh yeah, I've been, I'm just I've been stood there when I've climbed these ladders, looking back, thinking fuck me, I've climbed this ladder. It's took me years to do it, and that was all predicated on what's what what I was doing that to impress someone else or I was doing it and it's, it's, it's sad when you do that because you realise how many years you could have claimed back of your life if you'd not bothered you know what I mean yeah. and, it, and it's, it's so important that people get what you've just said there and that lands in their mind I really want that to land with all of you that listen to this it's just Alex's pivot or what he's saying there it's like get your get it straight on what you truly want so that you can go and achieve what you say you actually want rather than don't worry about what Frankie Lee wants or what Alex wants or what your mate Jeff fucking wants down the road. It's like, who cares about that? It's like, it's all about if you get straight in your mind what it is you want and work back from that outcome and then you can't, you can't end up saying that you've left anything on the table because you just go for the, you go for the goal you want. One of the things you said there was that you'd found this mentor that had, that had guided you how, and many people out there want mentors. Um, how can they find a mentor that aligns with them that can give them that insight that this guy's given you I think a lot of people get caught up on this trying to find find a mentor when they don't realise that there's mentors on the on the phone screens they've just got to find them like the, everyone's your mentor it's what you watch it's what you, it's what you absorb so it's what you read it's what you watch on YouTube I could tell a lot about a person by the Twitter feed their Instagram feed and the YouTube feed it's everything they're your mentors it's what you're looking at your mentors you don't realise oh, every everything that you're taking in is influencing you so the whole the whole world the whole that's your mentor, your phone's your mentor. So it's it's your mental diet. I don't think people have to quote unquote go out and get them. I mean it's it's great to obviously have them, and I think it will pay dividends um, to have one who's done what you want to do and can guide you in the right way and, and give you advice that no one else can can give you. The the guy that that I'm talking about, um, he's he's, he's my dad's old friend, and. Uh, when I say he's a mentor to me, he's uh, he's obviously just giving me some advice on, you know, like I said, I'm building a house, and uh, for the, I bought it two years ago, and it's still sitting there. It's going to get knocked down actually next week uh, to build the house that I've designed. But for the last year or so, I've you know I've been stressing about it because it's such a big undertaking. It's you know more than I've, I've essentially bit off more than I could chew. But yeah, as I expressed to you before, I'm glad that I have because it's it's making me want to go and go and get it again I was too laxy days and comfortable before and I was ashamed of the person I became so now it's given me that that fire again but I was having like losing sleep thinking oh it's just a bad decision if, you know what if it goes, all goes tits up what if it goes wrong what if I can't afford it and then I've got this and this so I just said that I asked I called him I said can I go and speak to him because I know he's the only really person who's done what I'm a, that I know that's done the kind of project that I'm about to do and just the insight he gave me was just invaluable um, and it's so simple as well he just, he just said, "I've done, I've done what you were about to do five or six times now, and I felt how you felt every time. It's natural." And uh, he said, "If you don't do it, you'll just, all, you know." So he said, "You're thinking about things that could go wrong." He said, "What well, was right?" And, I, I, and then I think to myself, "That's how I always, that's how I used to think." And I said to my dad as well, "I said I used to just, I used to have the attitude of just fuck it, let's go and figure it out later." And I'm trying to get that back. And he said, "It's just because you're getting older, son." He said, "As you get older, you start." being a bit more thinking through things and you've got a family now he said do it now because you're only going to get more hesitant with age so do it now so 
uh, yeah, no, it's just let's uh, let's just go. Let's, let's let's build something special, and it will be special. It's going to be a special place. Yeah, uh, that, that's that's interesting. You say that as you get older, you get more hesitant. How how are you keeping yourself in check so that you can make sure that you can keep blasting through these levels of the walls that you have to get through? Well, I think I think that um, committing to that, what I've, what I've committed to, is is really pushing me because it, all the money's going there. So the, the money has to, I have to keep keep going out there and get and getting more. And um, keeping yourself in check is just like you just need to keep pushing. I think you always need to just have that vision of the the, the person you want to become and the person I want to become has has lives in a place like that and has that family. So it's like I've got to go through these growing pains to become that person. So it's always just about trying to become that the, the, the higher version of yourself and working towards that and always having that in mind. How does that person act? How does that person deal with problems? How does that person attack a day and just show up as that person every day and you'll just you'll, you'll embody it. So you've almost took the the opinion of like empty the account, go and build this dream house that you wanted, that that's been your vision so that you have to go and get more money and you have to go and get busy and you have to go and get involved and you have to get that hunger back to go and strive for more because now you need to keep that cup full. Yeah. I, I didn't... I, I didn't realize because I've been so, uh, you know, life's become so busy now. I didn't uh, realize until I spoke to someone a few days ago, uh, a guy I know, I used to model for his brand maybe like 10 years ago now. And um, he was said, I'll hire you building a house. Um, Can you show me like the plans and stuff? So I showed him the plans and he was like, wow, I always remember you saying it was your dream to build a house. And I never even remember saying that. But it's always obviously been there for me. But I've just, you know, my, my mind's just got that cloudy. Recently, I, I don't, I didn't know. It's always been a, a goal of mine, but evidently it has. Uh, so, yeah, I'm just trying to make the younger me proud, and that's what he wanted. So that's what you're gonna get. Love it. The young, the younger me prou- proud. That's a, that's a powerful statement. And I think, I think a lot of us have got to remember what our childlike vision was because that's not too far from what we actually truly want. You know, when we actually break it down, if you if you go back and you think to yourself, what do, what what did my younger self actually want? You can really get into into thinking and, and curating that dream life that you actually said that you wanted, and, and go about creating it. Yeah, because because I it, it drives me mental when people say I don't know what I want or this and that. I'm like, well, sit with yourself a little bit longer and have a think about it. You you don't have time not to sit with yourself and think about it because you're telling me that you don't have the clarity. Yeah, you know, walking around without the clarity in what direction you're going is the is the most soul destroying part of life to be in because you're just treading water and that and that's what kills your ambition it kills your earning potential it kills your businesses it kills everything in your life kills your relationships you need to know where you're going especially and and when you cut when it comes to trying to be in a relationship if a, if a woman goes to me well ranky where are we going i can i can tell you exactly where the fuck we're going do you know what I mean? And I can I can tell you, give you a timeline and, and exactly what what I'm striving for, and I know what what know what mission I'm on. And by the way, you're on this mission with me. Get on the mission. If if you're a man without the clarity to do that, you're fucked. Like you can't you can't lead. You can't go and do, achieve what your your biggest version of yourself. Like yeah, I think I think I think a, a lack of clarity now is more prominent than ever because the world's so noisy now and the world's so busy now. You know, with technology and social media and stuff, people are just so consumed by it and consumed by what other people are doing or what other people's goals are or what other people's version of success is that they don't know what, what theirs is. So everyone doesn't need to, you know, my, my ver- like I said, my version of success and wants to be this, this best version of myself might not be the same for someone else. Some of my best friends aren't like that. And they, but it's, if, they, if you're happy, then you're successful. If, if you, as long as you're, you, what you're doing is what you, you've chosen, if you've chosen for yourself and someone else has chosen it for you and you're happy with it, if you're said, no, this is what I want to do, then you're, you know, hats off to you. You're successful. You haven't got to go and you know try and get the, try and be the this you know business owner or millionaire or whatever. As long as you're happy doing what you're doing and that's what you chose choose to do, then you're successful. It's just about people being true to themselves and not and not following someone else's path and and yeah, just having that self evaluation and that um, self awareness that they that they're doing it because it's true to them. Yeah, I, lo- I, lo- I love I love that and I love. I love the thread that we've gone down with this podcast because I wanted to I wanted to have like the insights into crafted the brand and all of that stuff and the creative and all the stuff that goes into that. But I, I wanted to bring out today the side of you that, that showed the family man side, that showed the morals, that showed the thought process, that showed the visionary parts of you as well. Because that is that to me 
encapsulates your full self and and and, and does it i like to ask this question at the end of every podcast because I, I think it really um allows you as the guest to to kind of shift your perspective but also gives the audience a, a key insight to take away it and it's this alex it's like if you were going to check out of the world tomorrow and you you, you can't leave crafted you can't leave anything else that you've made in this world but you could just leave one pearl of wisdom that could impact this audience and move them forward one percent from today what would that be for you i would say leave every person situation and place better than when you found it and if you do that you'll end up in a good place i think whether you're trying to start businesses form partnerships build relationships if you leave places and people better than you found them people will want to stay around you um i've never I definitely don't think I'm um, in any way, shape or form in the slightest bit more intelligent than anyone. I've always just known that I'm going there. Like, that's where I'm going. And, I, you know, I back myself enough to people just believe it and they go, okay, well, I'll come with you. So, and I always like to, you know, treat people well and, and like I said, leave leave places, people and situations better, better than I found them. I love that, mate. And I, I think that's so powerful. For, for in today's world when the world's being directed to think about 17 different things and relationships with multiple people and all the other stuff that we're being guided towards it's just a very busy world and I think we have to step back like you say and look and ascertain exactly what it is that we want and I hope this podcast for you guys gives you a true insight into what you actually want so that you can go out there and take your you know exactly what it is you want essentially so guys i hope that adds value to your life do me a solid favor you i'll put alex's links and the brand's links below this podcast so you can check to check out crafted and check out alex on social media as well and see how and and really look at alex's social media and the way that he's branding himself and crafted as well and how and how that goes together because i think you can learn a lot from looking at that but subscribe on all the platforms i'll see you next week much love Guys, do me a solid favor, drop a comment below this video and let us know who you want on the podcast next.